Welcome to Med Evidence, where we help you navigate the truth behind medical research with unbiased, evidence proven facts. Powered by Encore Research Group and hosted by cardiologist and top medical researcher, Dr. Michael Corin. Dennis and I were just joking before I, I got on air here and stated, hey, this is two docs talking LPA. And so uh, we're going to give you the opportunity to basically eavesdrop on our discussion. And you can see how two physicians who are really interested in the space, particularly the space of how to deal with this really, really, really bad cholesterol that we call LP little a, and ultimately what somebody that has this problem. I encountered my own uh, particular vulnerability to heart disease when I discovered that I had uh, high LP little a. I'm a classic LP little a person in that I had a very strong family history of vascular disease. Family history concept is really, really important. One of the things that struck me when I first learned about LPA is the really, really strong family history of people with this problem. So you'll, you'll get folks, for example, that have a father and mother who had some complications in their 20s, 30s, or 40s. And um, this is following each generation down the road. Yeah, it, well, the family history thing is, as, as you said, it's a huge component of the LP little a story. And, and uh, people who have high LP little a, I think their risk has to be taken somewhat in, in context of their family history. And if you have the family history I have and the LP little I have, uh, level I have, you're, you're faded practically. But um, so I remember when I was growing up, I was probably about 10 years old. And my mother's brother, who I assume was maybe in his mid 50s then, uh, had to have bilateral carotid endarterectomies. Um, and I remember hearing that term. It kind of caught my ear because who, what 10 year old would right. have any idea what that meant? And it was actually one of the first times I remember thinking, you know, I kind of maybe would want to be a doctor. Anyway, my mother's brother had it. Um, my mother herself wound up, wound up having to have uh, bypass surgery. She had complete venous graft failure within six months and wow. had to have a redo cabbage. When I, her sisters had heart disease as well, the, the details were a little bit murky. And that's when I really decided I better look into my own risk here in depth. And that's when I really started down the you know, pursuing my own risk. I was kind of a typical LP little a patient and remain so in that if you look at me and you looked at 10 other people in the room, you'd say, who's the last guy here to get vascular right. disease? It would probably sure. be me. I've always been very fit. I've exercised uh, all my life uh, and had other, virtually no other risk factors. Um, so when I looked into my own situation, I had a maximal stress test that was normal. Uh, I got a basic lipid panel that had a, you know, not ideal LDL. I think it was around 115, 120. Um, but then I got a, a much more detailed lipid panel. And uh, that was kind of the foreshadowing of my, my future troubles. My LP little A level was about four times the upper limits of normal. Uh, I had a CRP done that was elevated and a homocysteine that was slightly elevated. And I had a calcium score of zero. Five, five years later, I started down uh, what I describe as 10 years of vascular havoc. So you had an LPA level that was four times normal. And we're, we're going to actually explain what those numbers mean. And you had a, a negative coronary calcium count, basically. And so the question is, are you really at risk? Right. A, a typical normal level of LPA, meaning that you're not at high risk, using the milligrams per deciliter is typically thought of as 30 milligrams per deciliter or below. And when you get up to about 100 milligrams per deciliter, then we're talking about some serious issues. Similarly, for the, the concentration measurement in nanomoles, that would typically be something less than 75 as considered low risk. And then when you get up in that 150, 200 range, we're talking about something that's of great concern. About four years after I had my, my uh, negative calcium scan, I was surfing. Uh, it was a cold, windy morning for San Diego and uh, kind of an arduous paddle out. And I had my first episode of chest pain when I was paddling out. Uh, had some stents placed shortly thereafter. Three months after mm -hmm. my stent procedure, I was surfing, same beach, same situation, had chest pain again. I had restenosis in, in one of the stents. Mm -hmm. um, the other one didn't look too bad at that time. And we decided to stent within the stent with a different, uh, a different coating. With, these were drug eluting stents. Um, so, so just again, for clarification for, for the, the lay folks out there, not the lay he's, the okay. lay folks. <laughs> but um, uh, when you have restenosis, what's happening is that there is a biological phenomenon where the stent, which is usually a little piece of plastic that gets expanded in the artery, becomes blocked up. 
uh, typically through this proliferative process uh, that we now control better with certain types of stents and with using certain drugs after stents are placed. But one of the questions is if you have this milieu of LP little a, are you more prone to have this phenomenon where your stents actually get clogged up very quickly after the initial procedure? Well, uh, you might guess where the story goes from here. Uh, three months, three months years. later, <laughs> surfing chest pain again. And at this point, oh really, um, not only uh, was there some stent restenosis, there was progression of disease. Uh, you know, uh, I had one more go around with stents. Three months later, surfing, chest pain again. And uh, uh, so I had a six vessel bypass. In 2016 now, uh, I had another dramatic episode. Um, and this time it was cerebrovascular symptoms. Uh, mm -hmm. I was home one evening, uh, sat down on my computer, suddenly developed a left-sided headache, looked at my computer screen, nothing looked quite right, tried to describe to my wife what was going on uh, and uh, missed a couple words. And I had 40 or 50% carotid lesions in both uh, right and left internal carotids. Went to the ER, uh, was a stroke code, uh, and um, I had a really large lesion in my left carotid that had already embolized a couple of places. Yikes. Yeah, mm. so TPA uh, in the ER mm. that night. Uh, re Which is a clot buster. That's a clot buster that can be used for an acute right. stroke. Um, and after the longest night of my life was transferred over to the hospital where my good friend who'd done my bypass surgery uh, did a carotid endarterectomy on, uh, on me the next day. Wow. Wow. And that, that's an operation to clean up the carotid artery and establish full blood flow. So tremendous. Right. Wow. Quite a story. I've never had any issues with blood pressure, always at ideal weight, um, no diabetes, uh, never a smoker. It was, all, it was pretty much LP to lay. And then good fortune in my story, I guess the bad fortune is I have this problem, but the good fortune is I've had access to world-class healthcare and it's really gotten me through all this. Thanks for joining the MedEvidence podcast. To learn more, head over to medevidence.com or subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform.